Welcome everyone to the second talk on day two of the fall 2021 Martin Gardner Celebration of Mind talk series. Tamara Munzner is a professor of computer science at the University of British Columbia. She is best known these days for her work in information visualization. She's the author of really foundational text in that field, visualization, visualization analysis and design. Um, but in this context, more will know her from her uh, Geometry Center work. So um, Tamara, take it away. So first of all, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming to this talk. And hello in particular to a whole bunch of former Geometry Center um, PIs and staff and visitors and alumni of all stripes. So as Bob mentioned, what happened was I got a push to do something I'd been meaning to do for a very long time. Uh, about the Geometry Center video archives. So at the Geometry Center, um, we made a lot of videos um, and uh, some of them maybe you've seen, uh, although perhaps not in their high-res glory. Um, others may well not have been seen by anyone since their makers for a number of years. Um, and so the Geometry Center, for those who were not the old guard, um, was the National Science and Technology Center for the Computation and Visualization of Geometric Structures, which is why it has a short name, which is the Geometry Center. Um, and it was really a vortex of work in mathematical visualization, particularly um, geometric topology in the 90s. It was headquartered at the University of Minnesota. Um, and it was a sort of interesting structure where there were these 19 co-principal investigators scattered all over. Um, and then there was one physical location, uh, which was uh, at the U of M. Um, and there were also a lot of us technical staff and that's how I uh, intersected with the geometry centers. I was technical staff there. Um, I started out with my job title being apprentice which was a glorious job title uh, and then moved on to be technical staff. Um, and so we did many things there. We, um, we developed a lot of software. Some of you might've seen GMView which was actually being used to make a lot of the videos that I'll be showing. Um, and we did a lot of very um, sort of careful high production value video production to try to bring these ideas to general audiences by carefully not using uh, technical language, but having approachable language and the heavy, heavy use of computer graphics and visualization. Um, and so these flagship videos of Not Not um, and Upside In and Shape of Space are possibly what a lot of people knew. Um, they got shown at things like um, science museums and SIGGRAPH, uh, we were even, the connection to Martin Gardner might be our delight when there was a picture from an early draft about sitting on the cover of Scientific American, uh, which led to great glee. Um, and, uh, but in addition to these, where we really tried to have these as communicative to the general public kinds of vehicles, there was actually a lot of other videos made at the center as well. Um, and so I'll be showcasing some of those nearer to the end um, and talking a bit about the process of making those. Um, and the other incredibly exciting thing is that even though the Geometry Center has been closed since uh, the, the mid 90s, um, it lives on in that people love these videos enough that they uploaded them to, to YouTube many, many times. Um, and actually there've been millions of views, uh, which was great. Um, I had avoided pointing to them from my own homepage for a long time because they were in print, but quite recently, just this year, it became clear that nobody actually buys <laughs> physical media with videos on them anymore, um, like VHS and DVD. And so we got them declared out of print, which means that the rights reverted to us, which means we can post everything, including the pretty amazing written supplements. Um, and so today is the unveiling um, of those, which I'll show uh, in just a few moments. Um, and also, uh, some people have, in a labor of love, upsampled uh, two of the videos to HD resolution. Thank you to YouTuber Last Ginger for doing that. So we're going to see um, both Outside In and Not Not at full HD 1440 resolution, even though it was actually made at 480p, uh, thanks to some extremely clever use of AI deep learning upsampling. So what I've done is we've got this new page, uh, which has a lot of content that we didn't have before. Um, so from left to right, we've got not not, which is about uh, the complements of knots on hyperbolic space, outside in about turning the sphere inside out, and shape of space uh, about shapes that are finite uh, but have no boundaries, some of the same territory as not not, but uh, a little less uh, an explosion of ideas uh, and a little more pedagogical. So the thing we have now up are these uh, high quality scans of the supplements. Um, and so 
we've got, uh, these are, uh, one is a 50 page booklet um, that uh, is uh, all black and white internally um, in sort of Q and A format. Uh, and this was done by um, Charlie Gunn and David Epstein. Um, we've got the Making Waves supplement, which uh, was created by Silvio, uh, which is full color throughout. And it's also got this format as it goes through the script um, and then has all kinds of sidebars going deeper into the ideas about what's actually going on there. Um, and then there's also with Shape of Space, uh, which many of you might know is a book by Jeff Weeks. Um, this was a workbook intended for K-12 curriculum. Uh, and so it's got a bunch of materials for teachers to use accompanying not only his full book, which is still in print, um, but these videos we made uh, and so this is now also uh, rights reverted um, back to Jeff. And so we've been able to post that as well. So this is a lot of activities uh, that uh, back up that book. So these are all now publicly available. Thanks to Gathering for Gardener for making all of this get motivated to actually happen rather than be on the to-do list where it's been for a while. Um, so let, without further ado, let's actually blast forward and watch some of these amazing videos. Um, Not, Not was the first of the trilogy. Um, and it really was this incredibly ambitious um, romp through a lot of ideas from knot theory and hyperbolic geometry. And um, again, all of these things use, without using technical language, but without having any um, attempt to um, have things oversimplified. This was really just diving directly in. And it was really this question of how far could you go and bring people along with you for this ride of getting into some extremely deep ideas while bringing them with, with the computer graphics and the non-technical language. So let's actually leap into that. Uh, we're gonna, I'm only gonna show excerpts because we don't have time to show all of these. So let's get to 245. What is left when you take away the points of a knot or link from three-dimensional space. What's left when you can't see the knot? Not just because there's no matter there, but because space itself doesn't extend to where the knot used to be. We'll look first at a simpler picture. What is life like in a space with a single line missing? Or in a plane with a single point removed? We'll remove the point by pulling it upward, stretching the plane into a cone which grows sharper and sharper. Finally, the point disappears off to infinity and the cone becomes a cylinder. The point at the cone's tip is special. It's called a cone point. As the cone steepens, the radius of a circle about the cone point increases though its circumference stays constant. Meanwhile, an outsider looking from above sees the picture unchanged. We introduce an observer who lives inside the cone's surface and a few objects for him to observe. To the insider, light rays travel in straight lines. But the outsider sees those lines as curving around the cone point. To understand the insider's view, cut a cone made of paper and unroll it onto a plane. Since unrolling does not distort the paper, lines which are straight for the insider will be straight lines on the plane. This wedge is a building block for the cone and is called a fundamental domain. The two edges resulting from the cut represent a single line back on the cone. Anything crossing one edge reappears at the other. We can mend the cut by stretching and gluing the edges. We get the outsider's view where light rays look curved. The position of the imaginary cut is arbitrary. These insiders, touring the cone in their car, don't notice as we move the cut to follow them. They look right through the cut and see what seems to be another copy of the wedge. For special values of the cone angle, a whole number of wedges fit together neatly, 
but usually the remaining gap is filled with part of a wedge. Here's another way a cone surface differs from a plane. In a plane, only one straight line connects two points. All right, I'm gonna skip forward a bit. Um, so we've seen a little bit of the setup. We see how life would look in a space with a single line removed. Let's now turn to the question, what is life like in a space from which the Borromean rings have been removed? We place six cone axes with order two symmetry on the faces of a cube. This cube will be a fundamental domain for our experiment. Let's try and see what this space is from the outside. Remember that the walls of a fundamental domain determined by an axis of symmetry should be thought of as being glued together. We first glue the walls containing red axes and then efface them as they are no longer necessary. Notice how the blue axes are joined together into an ellipse. We now glue the walls containing green axes. This joins the red axes into an ellipse. We have folded along four of the six faces of the original cube to form an ellipsoid. All that remains is to fold along the blue axis, which has also become an ellipse. To do this, we make the front and back hemisphere of the ellipsoid bulge up. The green axes, too, have joined to form a green ellipse. Notice what we have now, the Borromean rings. Now we've seen that the outside view of our fundamental domain is the Borromean rings. What is the insider's view like? Remember, around each cone axis, the insider sees two copies of every object. We first activate the red axes. The image from our fundamental domain gets replicated in the next door cube by the front axis. And both of these images get replicated by the back axis. And so on, until we have copies of the cube extending all the way to infinity in both directions. Next, turn on the green axes which face forward. This creates another infinite row of cubes. Turning on the other green axes reproduces these two rows to give four rows, and so on, until we have an infinite horizontal plane of cubes. Finally, when the blue axes are turned on, they make the two-dimensional pattern be repeated in layers to fill up the whole space. This is what it looks like to live inside the space created by the order two axes on the sides of the cube. We can also work out what happens when the Borromean axes have higher order symmetry. For instance, if we want them to be order four axes, we must build a fundamental domain with 90 degree angles along these axes. We must modify our cube so it has right angles along its six axes. Impossible, you say? You may not have noticed it, but we're escorting you into Lobachevskian, or hyperbolic, geometry, where this and many other things are possible. This dodecahedron, in true hyperbolic perspective, has 90 degree angles between every pair of adjacent faces. When we look directly down on the red axis, we see that the faces meeting there make a right angle. We can glue three more copies of the dodecahedron around this axis. We can move our viewpoint inside this figure. Now we have fourfold symmetry around one axis. Before exploring further, we'll remove the walls and change the shape and color of the beams. We can continue to add copies of the dodecahedron around each colored axis. First, let's do this for some of the available green, blue, and red axes. Eventually, the copies of the dodecahedron fill space without overlap. Just as we tiled ordinary space with cubes, we've tiled hyperbolic space with regular dodecahedra. 
Let's fly around a little in hyperbolic space to get a better feel for it. Notice how quickly apparent size changes as we move. This is one of the biggest qualitative differences between our everyday space and hyperbolic space. This is what it looks like to live inside the space created by order four axes along the edges of the dodecahedron. By adjusting the angles at the colored axes, we can derive similar pictures for order five symmetry, order six symmetry, and so on for all higher orders. Notice that as the order of the symmetry increases, the colored axes of the dodecahedron grow very short and move far away. Finally, in the limit, the red, green, and blue axes have receded to infinity. The resulting figure is called a rhombic dodecahedron. The six colored axes have been transformed into six vertices at infinity. To better understand the geometry of this shape, we add transparent walls to one copy of the figure and rotate hyperbolic space around its center. As the vertices at infinity pass behind our eye, we see interesting patterns. So that is our taste of Not Not at high res, uh, seen for the first time possibly by some of you ever um, with this glorious upsampled version. And so that gives you a taste of the kinds of things that were done in that video. Um, extremely ambitious, single frame recorded. Uh, much of it was done using RenderMan, which is the same software that's used in uh, even today, to this day, um, commercial movies and special effects. Um, so developed at Pixar originally. Um, and one of the people involved in uh, making that was Pat Hanrahan, who is one of the 19 co-PIs of the Geometry Center. So let's now uh, take a look at the second in the trilogy. Um, and that is Outside In, uh, a video about uh, everting a sphere. Um, and so the video itself is going to do a better job than I can do of giving us first the premise and then a little bit of uh, the center point of that. Uh, so without too much further ado, I will run Outside In. It was similarly made with quite high production values using RenderMan single frame recorded uh, for most of it, although some early scenes were done um, using a uh, system like soft image. So let us uh, run a couple of excerpts from outside in. I read somewhere that mathematicians can turn a sphere inside out. Yes, that's true. What's the big deal? Just poke a hole in it and pull it through. Sure, but the point is to do it without making a hole. But then it seems impossible. You're right. You cannot do it with an ordinary sphere, like a basketball. You have to understand the rules of the game. This sphere is made of an abstract elastic material that can stretch and bend and pass through itself. But you cannot rip or puncture this material without destroying it. And you cannot crease it or bend it sharply. If the surface can pass through itself, what's the problem? Do you think allowing self-intersections makes it easy? Try it. I'll push the two halves right through each other. Be careful. What about that ring around the equator? Remember, you mustn't tear or crease it. Ah, uh, let me try again. That's no good either. You're pinching it infinitely tight. But then there's no way. It's impossible. You'd have to crease or pinch it to turn it inside out. It is surprising, but watch this. Is this it? Is this a sphere turning inside out? You bet. That wasn't easy to follow, was it? To figure out what's going on, let's look at something simpler. A circle. We'll build a vertical wall along the circle so that we can color the two sides differently. Can you gradually turn this circle into this other circle, where the purple and gold sides are reversed without creating sharp corners? Of course. I can turn a rubber band inside out. Remember, we're really trying to turn the circle inside out, 
We only built the wall so we could see the different sides. Oh, yes. The wall has to stay vertical, and it can't have creases, but it can pass through itself. Fine. Let me try. Watch out. That was a sharp bend. If we could make sharp bends in the material, we'd be able to turn any curve into any other by moving each point of the initial curve in a straight line toward a target point in the final curve. But I can avoid corners altogether by making a loop smaller and smaller. That's an interesting idea, but pulling a loop tight is not really a gradual change. It's like having a corner in disguise. So it's against the rules. Well, if you can't have corners, and you can't pull loops tight, I think it's impossible to turn the circle inside out. Yes, you're right. Wait a minute. Am I supposed to believe that you can turn a sphere inside out, but not a circle? Yes. There is something fundamental about curves that would have to change if you were to turn a circle inside out. And that something cannot change under our allowed motions. And what's that? I'll explain. Imagine a monorail atop the wall. Now the rule about monorail traffic is that the car only travels forward and it always keeps the purple wall on its right. We'll use a diagram to monitor the car's direction. On this track, the car is always turning left. As it goes around the circle once, it makes one full turn toward the left. On a more complicated track, the car might sometimes be turning left and sometimes right. But the net amount of turning after one complete circuit is always some number of full turns in one direction or the other. So now we're going to skip by more monorails, an entire exposition of Morse theory in both 2D and 3D without ever using the word Morse theory, a whole little scene involving um, photos from George Francis's amazing book, A Topological Picture Book, um, and he is also going to be uh, with us in the Q&A. And this one? Whoa. You're not going to ask me to do every single curve of turning number one, are you? Of course not. What we need is a general method. Do you remember the simple way to transform one curve to another when sharp bends are allowed? Yes. You just go straight from one to the other. That's the one. When the curves have the same turning number, this method can be adapted to work without sharp bends. The trick is to add waves to the curve. Can we do it on a simpler one? Sure. We start by marking small pieces of the curve that will serve as guides for the transformation. We'll concentrate on these segments now. We move the centers of the guide segments straight toward their final destinations on the circle, without any rotation. Next, we rotate the guides so that they are lined up with the circle. Okay, what about the parts in between? That's where the waviness comes in. We make the connecting segments between adjacent guides bulge out into corrugations. This allows the segments to move freely around each other, as long as they remain more or less parallel. Oh, I see. The guides can move around without creating sharp bends. Correct. Here is the transformation of the whole curve. The original curve, in blue, develops sharp corners, but the wavy curve is springy enough to remain smooth throughout. We have to keep adjacent guides roughly parallel as we rotate them to align with the circle. This is possible as long as the turning number of the original curve is 1. Why can't we align the guides if the turning number isn't 1? Watch what happens when we try to turn a figure 8 into a circle. And here, both the initial and final curve have turning number zero. Using this method, or others, you can always transform one curve into another with the same turning number. This is called the whitney graustein theorem.
And what does this have to do with the sphere? A lot. Think of the sphere as a stack of circles, deformed into a barrel shape and closed off by caps above and below. Just as we made our curves more pliable by dividing them into guide segments connected by waves, we divide the barrel into guide strips that alternate with wavy strips. The waviness dies out at the top and bottom, so as to match the caps. Hmm, this is going to get complicated. Then for now, let's look at a single guide strip along with the caps. Start by pushing the two caps past each other. Before, when I pushed the poles through, it made a crease. Stop before the crease, when the guide has a loop in the middle. Now we turn the two caps in opposite directions, because we want to convert the loop in the middle to twisting at the ends. Oh, I know. It's like a belt. If you put a loop in the middle and pull the ends tight, the loop turns into twisting. Right. Then you can straighten out the belt by turning each end half a turn in opposite directions. To finish the eversion, we just need to push the middle of the guide strip back through the center of the sphere. Hmm. Can I see how two guide strips interact? Sure. You can see that there are two places where the strips intersect near the central axis. And the gold sides that started facing out are now facing in. Here is the whole process with all the guides. The polar caps just move up and down and then rotate into place. Ah, that's why they don't require any springiness. Exactly. Now let's look at two guides and the corrugation between them, from a pole to the equator. This chunk is the fundamental building block of the eversion. The whole sphere is made from 16 rotated copies of this piece. That looks pretty complicated. Yes, but the corrugation is just following the twisting of the guide strips that you saw before. Can I see that from pole to pole? Yes. The corrugation provides flexibility between the guides so that their motion does not create any pinches or creases, just like the waves in the curve that we saw before. Let me see the whole thing. We corrugate the connecting strips between the guides and push the caps past each other. We twist the caps to undo the middle loops and push the equator across the sphere. Finally, we uncorrugate. I still don't understand. Is there some other way to look at this? So that gives you some sense of outside in. There is yet still more. Um, but what we want to do is keep going. And one of our challenges then at the center was, could we make videos like this, but instead of taking multiple person years of effort over multiple calendar years of time, could we do this kind of thing to a budget? Um, and so what we tried doing for the third video was a limited budget, like say six months of calendar time, six months of you know human hours in total across the many people who are doing it. And that's what we have with uh, the shape of space. So this was to try to see whether we could get, you know, 80% of the benefits of this um, with, you know, 20% of the costs. Have you ever wondered how big the universe is? How many stars are there? Does space go on forever? The answer depends on the shape of space. Let's explore some possibilities. There's an interesting star. This star looks familiar. Haven't we been here before? What's going on? What kind of space is this where we keep seeing the same stars again and again? It's easier to explain in a two-dimensional universe than a 3D one. But what would a 2D universe be like? Let's call it Flatland. Life in two dimensions has its problems. 
When two flatlanders want to pass one another, they can't go around each other or to the side as we would, since they can't leave the plane. Our athletic flatlanders must jump over one another to continue on their way. The flatlanders live on the one-dimensional surface of their two-dimensional planet, just as we spacelanders live on the 2D surface of our 3D planet. The flatlanders' planet is orbiting a sun. Their sun is a two-dimensional disk, just as our sun is a three-dimensional ball. Like ours, their sun is just one of many stars in their universe. Let's watch the Flatlanders explore their universe. They head straight off into space and are surprised to come across their own sun. We three-dimensional people can see them without the fourth dimension. We can visualize 3D spaces using only three dimensions for our drawings. We first try to understand a Flatlanders universe without the extra dimension. Suppose their universe is a torus. We'll save a copy of it, cut the torus once, and deform it into a cylinder. Cut it again, and open it into a square. This square is a fundamental domain for the Flatlanders universe. We now see their universe using only two dimensions. The Flatlanders can still travel about their universe as before. When looking at a fundamental domain, we must imagine that its edges are glued together. Anything leaving one glued edge returns at the other. The way we glue them determines the shape of the space. It doesn't matter where we put the cuts. We need cuts to draw the fundamental domain, but they don't really exist in the space itself. When our cut passes through the Flatlanders, they don't feel a thing. What do the Flatlanders see in this universe? Their line of sight travels around the universe and they see the back of their own spaceship. Like the Flatlanders themselves, their line of sight can't leave their two-dimensional space. They see what appears to be a copy of themselves. Indeed, they see images of themselves in many directions. This tiled picture shows what the Flatlanders see and that their universe is boundless. They'll never reach an edge. Now we're ready for three dimensions. Take a cubicle block of space. We'll use this for our fundamental domain in three dimensions, just as we used a square in 2D. We glue the left and right walls. Now the spaceship can travel around this finite universe, passing the same stars again and again. We glue the top and bottom. And finally glue the back to the front. Now the space has no boundary and the ship can travel in any direction. This space is called a three torus. Let's ride the spaceship inside the three torus. Even though the three torus is finite, we have the illusion of flying in an infinite space. There are only two stars in this universe, but we see each one over and over. What if we do this in 3D? Two pairs of faces connect as in the three torus. To make the flip, connect the top of the right face to the bottom of the left face and vice versa. After one trip, the spaceship appears mirror reversed. After a second trip, it returns to its original state. Let's see what this space looks like from the inside. As in 2D, we see infinitely many images of our ship. Half are mirror reversed, half are not. 
When we roll, our reversed images roll in the opposite direction. Life in this space is different than in the three tours, where all the copies of the ship move in the same direction, like a flock of birds. We fly this way and see ships in neighboring rows flying in the opposite direction. The mirrored images turn as we do to fly along paths that seem to cross ours, but they can never hit us. That's impossible in this. All right, so that was some of The Shape of Space. Um, and so that was the trilogy. I also want to let people know that there's some other things as well, and that's what might be new. We've started on this process of digitizing the entire uh, sort of unique sections of the Geometry Center video archive. And so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a taste from the ones we've uploaded so far. And that ranges from things like uh, some live footage from geometry and, and imagination classes. Get the right approximate curvature. Uh, let me get that a little. So this is our Bill Thurston and John Conway uh, and uh, Doyle and um, a few others all got together to actually teach math teachers. So a little bit of footage here. On the inside, but positive curvature on the outside. However, the banana has an interesting mechanism for getting its curvature. Um, it tends to be that, I mean, you can see there, there are creases in the banana skin. It's, it's actually relatively flat in this part of it. It's almost, it's almost straight, not quite, just along here. So it's just slightly negatively curved in all this part. And it has a way of concentrating its sort of Gaussian curvature along, along, along the scene. Anybody who's done sewing might know that that's one of the devices for making, you know, in shaping clothes, um, tailors or seamstresses or whoever, they have to be aware, or the people who design it at least, have to be aware of curvature because the body is curved. That's what makes clothes fit, to get the right approximate curvature. You do it by having seams that sort of don't quite match each other when they lie flat. Consider what is the area of this moon and the one on the other side that's just like it. What, the, double moon. The, the area of this green double moon. The green what, angle is called G, by the way. So what's the area of this of this combination of two moons? 4G. 4G. Okay, well, right. let's, let's put this on. These two bits of paper go in regions whose total area is 2G. That's one of the moons. Turn it around. And these two, good. So, uh, look, I'll just keep a note while we're, we're doing it. We've got 4G so far. Okay. Now, what about the moons that are determined by this red angle, this one here, and then the identical one on the back? What's their area? 4R. 4R. 2R in front, 2R so in front. Uh, oh, look, I'll have to put this on top. There's 2R going on. So we got that one marked. Get a mark one for that. Yeah, and here, this was the R angle, so that's a, these two. Oh, look, I'm putting this bottom one first, too. These two add up to another two. Oh! So, so far, I've pasted in, so to speak, 4G plus 4R. Okay, now this, there's a third angle here, the yellow angle, and the moon it determines has what area? Four or wide. Well, that one of the moons has two, has two y. Together, they give you four y. So there's we've got two y. Okay. Okay. So now we've measured that the area of the whole sphere, because everything is now covered. The What's area the of the whole sphere, sphere is four g plus four r plus four y. But the area of the whole sphere is four pi. So 4G plus 4R plus 4Y equals 4Y. So now let's have a round of applause for that fantastic group. There was actually some um, drafts made of uh, all these videos early on to try to make sure that things were actually possible. So let's see a quick preview of something David ben -Svi made uh, with Matt Hedrick, which is some early tests of making sure the sphere of Ogerton code actually did what we thought it did. And this is an aversion where we go from Bill Thurston. And uh, so this was uh, the code that was then later, um, in fact, uh, a rewritten version of this was used for the final outside-in video that Nathaniel Thurston did quite a lot of uh, changes to. 
and we see that Bill has turned into Steve Smale, another one of the original sphere averters. I see David nodding. He might not have seen this footage in a very long time. What else have we got? We've got all kinds of things. So instead of the really high production value stuff uh, made over many years using uh, videos, there's a lot of stuff where it's just basically live action, uh, where by live action, I mean live action off a computer screen. The mathematical um, animation, not not. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit to, you know, the kinds of things we would show Geometry Center visitors in demos. As in the previous case, we can see- Where we're actually just moving things around on the screen. Around the edge. Um, we can see things like uh, the Geometry Center had a summer student program where we had students come for entire summers and their projects were documented through video. Um, given this morning's lecture on dimension, this is one of my personal favorites. So I'll give you a sense of what this one is about. The shadows cast by an aerial light source can be quite complicated. Let's look at the relatively simple example of a square light source and a square occluding object. Notice that part of the shadow is totally dark. This part, which is completely hidden from the light, is called the umbra. The other regions where some, but not all of the light is blocked by the occluder, is the penumbra of the shadow. To better see the structure of the penumbra, we can construct a diagram that divides the shadow into separate regions. From vertices of the light source, we project edges of the occluder down onto the plane. And from edges of the light source, we project through vertices of the occluding object. When we do this with all edges and vertices of both objects, the resulting shadow diagram shows us where different parts of the light source become visible or are hidden by the occluder. And of course, what we see there is a lovely hypercube structure, which is not at all obvious. One of the things I loved about the center was how we got people from mathematics and computer graphics all actually in the same place. Uh, doing interesting things together. Another one I wanted to briefly show, there were some projects like, for example, the Teichmuller Navigator. Uh, this was an application for the um, long dead Next computer. Um, and, uh, but this was sort of an example of the kinds of software people would make there. I spent my summer at the Geometry Center creating the Teichmuller Navigator as an interactive application on the Next. The program begins by giving the user a tiling of the hyperbolic plane with regular octagons. This tiling corresponds to a particular Riemann surface, or, in other words, to a surface with a particular geometry upon it. In the case of the octagon, our surface will be a two-hole torus. You can visualize this if you imagine gluing together the edges of the octagon. We can move to a different tiling by selecting an arbitrary vertex and pulling it to a new location in the unit disk. All right, so that gave you a little bit of a sense of some of the student projects. We also had a lot of people come through the center uh, who were visitors to the center. Uh, Dennis Roseman did a lot with knotted spheres uh, going from 4D to 3D. Here's just a tiny bit of that video. Here is a projection of a torus in four space using a red-blue color gradient for the projected fourth coordinate. By the variety of colors, we see that it does not lie in three-dimensional space. This projection, however, is a subset of three-dimensional space and as such is knotted in three-dimensional space. We rotate this object rigidly in four-dimensional space. At the end, the image is clearly unknotted. The projection, a subset of three space, is equivalent to the four-dimensional object by a deformation that alters only the fourth coordinate of the point. So just enough to give you a flavor of that. Um, and so, you know, some of these were sort of full-on scripted videos. Some were more like video overheads that people could show at their next talk that weren't really intended to stand alone. Uh, so there's quite a mixture of these things. Uh, and uh, so all of you are free to browse and peruse, and there will be even more uploaded over time. Um, so with that, uh, I've at least given you a flavor of some of the things we've done. But now what I want to do is switch over to Q&A. We've got a whole lot of uh, former Geometry Center folks, um, including Charlie Gunn and um, Stuart Levy and Mark Phillips, uh, who are all on the technical staff. Uh, Sylvia Levy was also technical staff. We have um, summers, former summer students and visitors like David Van uh, We've got former PIs like David Epstein, uh, former postdocs like Rick Wicklin, uh, Carrie Sandvig, also former tech staff. Maybe we can have some memories or perspectives from the other panelists. I recounted in the chat that uh, my wife and I got onto an airplane once and uh, while it was waiting to take off, the, the uh, videos, the individual videos on every, uh, in front of every seat were playing. And um, 
suddenly started playing the Grateful Dead show, show well at the same time um, not not was doing this fly through hyperbolic space and it was really psychedelic so I was very anyway it was a thrilling moment for me I could add something about um, I mean Silvio knows much more about this than I do but um, the uh, this process of uh, making space wavy uh, and using that to prove theorems. Um, I think it was probably thought of at roughly the same time by, by Bill Thurston and by Michel Gromov. And Gromov's published hugely influential works proving all kinds of results using this technique of making these objects wavy so that they can pass through each other um, easily. So that was, I'll just point out that this has very, been very influential in certain parts of mathematics. If I could just comment that uh, I, I was one of the people who attended the Geometry Center as a guest for a week in August, I think it was 1994, and coming from a very formal abstract algebra background, my education had no pictures in it whatsoever at the undergraduate level or the graduate level at Cornell. And it was a revelation to me, and one, one, of three thing, one of three things that I stumbled on in those mid-90s years that, that changed how I taught, and how I, you know, at a liberal arts college, the geometry center being the first one on those incredible videos, the second being, visiting Tony DeRose, who later worked at Pixar, but I visited him when he still worked at the University of Washington and learned about wavelets and image compression. And the third being uh, David Henderson's amazing approach, inspired in part by Thurston to teaching geometry. And I mentioned that simply because our last lecture this week uh, on Sunday evening is going to be uh, Dana Taimina about how it changed her life. And she ended up marrying David Henderson away sadly a few years ago so anyway it had a big influence on how I approached teaching although I didn't contribute anything to the areas uh, in question but the, the interface of mathematics especially visual geometry and topology and computer graphics you know just an eye opener for me. There's a question about how the dialogue for the scripts was written and uh, it was basically um, a long process of uh, tuning it to the images that, that we could produce or that we wanted to produce. So there was a, an idea about how we wanted to present the mathematics, but uh, because some of the mathematics was clearly um, too difficult to visualize, we uh, tried to think of metaphors, we tried to think of familiar examples, like a monorail, you know, not that that's familiar to everyone, but we basically uh, had undergraduates, graduates, and faculty and technical staff uh, all uh, discussing these things as, as we moved along in the plot line. And uh, some of these things really took literally a whole year to refine. Um, I think that's how long it took for uh, Outside Den to, to coalesce into a single script. Like sometimes even we ourselves would look at like uh, sometimes when, you know, the guy's like, hey, wait a minute, because I would be like, hey, wait a minute. What? Why can't you just do the thing? And then it's like, oh, right, right. It has to stay in the plane. And that's, you know, and then we added the scene about how you can't just take the thing up and and do that. And so some of the some of it was we ourselves being confused. Some of it was showing it. We actually showed drafts of this to many, many visitors. Hundreds of people would come through the geometry center ranging from like fourth grade match classes to research mathematicians. So we would get the sort of broad cross section of people responding to it. Um, there were some other questions. The sound effects are hoot, who came up with those? Um, there was a, a local uh, sound company that actually uh, worked on both Not Not and Outside In. Um, unfortunately, they're no longer extant. Uh, Lamont, they are, was it Hudson Forrester? But uh, they particularly did a good job with the Outside In ones, I think. So we have a good question in the Q and A. Um, Adam Rosian is curious what the Geometry Center folks think of the current state of math education, in particular, how things are the same or different. Um, the web was new, but maybe not much has changed. 
I mean, I, what I certainly personally noticed is that a lot of stuff that used to take incredible amounts of time and energy and money is now something that individual people can do and do well. Like one of the questions in the chat was, you know, this legacy of these kinds of expository videos like um, Three Blue, One Brown. And, you know, there's a lot of people who can just sit down and do this kind of thing using current tools, uh, which is um, pretty stupendous. I mean, and the fact that you don't need physical distribution of videotapes, I actually found when I was looking for material for this, I found a talk I gave at SIGGRAPH in 1995, where I talked about tapeless video, this exciting idea that you could not have a videotape and yet have video. And this was when the web was very new. So the idea that there's these low cost creation and distribution channels, I think is stupendous. I'm curious what other folks think. I think certainly the attitude of the math community to visualization is very different today than it was when the Geometry Center was around. I think at the time it was uh, much of a struggle to convince a lot of mathematicians that you know computers were a useful a useful tool that they could use in the research and visualizing visualizing abstract mathematics was was something that you know that they should be could be doing on a regular basis. And I think today that's much more commonplace. And there are lots of great animations, a lot of great visualizations that people see. At the time, I think there was a lot of resistance and kind of like, is this really what we should be? What we should be doing. I think in retrospect, the Geometry Center was very much ahead of its time. Uh, but maybe I, just to say the, about my experience at Geometry Center, in just a couple of words that I, I think the closest I could describe it is, is, is Hogwarts. I mean, it was really for me, that was my education and it was completely magical experience. I mean, I don't know if Al Martin was Dumbledore, but it was, uh, it was just a place where it completely changed what I thought of math as what math could be. And I got exposed to a lot of amazing Amazing idea, amazing people, and the community was just was just phenomenal, and uh, just made it into this kind of exciting, magical thing that you, everyone who I think who went through it realized it's something, not this kind of I don't know formal starchy thing, but something something magical you could be involved in. So that's definitely stayed with me. I used to call it Mathland. You could learn foreign languages either by going to the country or studying them out of books, and I felt like the Geometry Center was a place to learn math in Mathland, in a way that you just couldn't get out of a book. George. I don't want to uh, throw too much uh, sand into this discussion, but you know, in the mid nineties, one time, the few times I went to SIGGRAPH, there were four, count them, four entries in the evening theater that dealt with mathematics, that, was ma that showed mathematics to the world. The next year there were only two, and that's the last of them. So um, think about this HMO craze now, the virtual reality or whatever. How much of it is math? Where's, where's, where's all this geometry that we created or started uh, and all the people we trained to do these things? Um, there isn't appreciably much more around. So it's not all so great. I mean, yes, one can do all of these different things, but they're not doing it. Um, it's mostly games. And the hard math that was shown in the geometry center is still being shown in the geometry center in its new incarnation. Thank you very much, Tamara. And thank you very much to all of the other geometry center panelists. And uh, thank you again, everyone. Hope to see you and gather.